Author and historian Stephen Johnson a few years ago wrote a book called How We Got to Now. And it's kind of a unique look on history in that he uh, studies the development of certain scientific inventions or evolutions that ended up shaping history or not just creating new things for society. And uh, he noted that in the 13th and 14th century, as people were starting to work with glass and learn how to shape it, it moved from just sort of random decorative objects into uh, people shaping it and curving it to use it as um, lenses, which became glasses and then telescopes. And then he said they started to do something else with it that in his mind began to shape and change society as a whole that 700 years ago uh, started, in a sense, a revolution that we are living in now. Listen to what he says in his book, How We Got to Now. Social conventions, as well as property rights and other legal customs began to revolve around the individual rather than the collective units, like the family, the tribe, the city, or the kingdom. People began writing about their interior lives with far more scrutiny. Hamlet ruminated on stage. The novel emerged as a dominant form of storytelling, probing the inner mental lives of its characters at an unrivaled depth. The psychological novel, in a sense, is the kind of story you start wanting to hear, listen, once you begin spending meaningful hours of your life staring at yourself in the mirror. The mirror, he says, was the invention or the use of glass that began to change and shape how we see and interact with the world as human beings, particularly in a sense that moving from the place of we to the place of I, from the place and the world of us to the place of me. He said it started to shift where we no longer saw ourselves primarily from the vantage point of the collective units that we were a part of, family, kingdom, tribe, or whatever, but primarily as a me and an I, such that now if someone asks you, um, oh, what, what, would you, what do you want to do with your life or where are you heading in your career? You don't say we as in referring to what you and your family has discussed or um, you know, what seems best to us, we say, well, well, here's what I want to do. I'm planning on doing this. This is what I would like to become or the me I want to be, right? We have moved significantly to the individual sense of ourselves in this world. And according to him, it's 700 years in the making, almost in a sense, not only, but along with the invention of the mirror. Now add to that what many of you have in your purse or your pocket today, the cell phone. A cell phone that has the kind of computing power that just a few decades ago only existed in a multi, multi million dollar machine in NASA, which they used to land the space shuttle. The idea that an individual could possess that kind of power would have blown NASA's mind even more than putting someone on the moon. And what they used to land a space shuttle, we use now to order Uber Eats or to create a new Memoji to curate our social media profile. The, the cell phone, the technology that it has given us is, has be, is a highly personalized one, whereas each of us have one and also we use it in our world to create a sense of who we are in ourselves, And so we have our own customized screens. And again, we have our own emojis and we have our own um, platforms that are our person or our persona that we are curating that uh, technology has made our lives even more um, highly individualistic. And in fact, in many ways, more uh, isolated in the things that we do on our own. Think about this. Just a few years ago or just a few decades ago, the terms um, online school, asynchronous learning, work from home, online teams, solopreneur, and virtual church would have either been not commonly used or not making sense to most people at all. And yet those are terms to describe how many of us engage in the world we live in now. This is a normal part of people's lives. And the great casualty with this, this is not new, as, as, as Johnson said, this is 700 years in the making. The great casualty of all this, if I can suggest this, is our relationships, our interpersonal 
relationships. By every metric you look at, our relationships are suffering. Fewer and fewer people are getting married, getting into permanent, lifelong monogamous relationships. Fewer and fewer people are having children. The birth rate is at an all-time historic low in our country and in our continent. The divorce rates are higher, that marriage unions are breaking apart at a higher rate. We have many, many people who would say that uh, they are people of faith, and yet they would say, yeah, but I'm not a part of any church or any community. I'm not connected in relationally. In 2023, the U.S. Surgeon General declared that loneliness and isolation were an epidemic in the United States. He said that nearly 50% of Americans on recent surveys would indicate some experiences or feelings of loneliness or isolation. And so he was marshalling the energy and creativity and research and dollars of the medical community and the investment community to think, we need to get on top of this. This is an epidemic, loneliness and isolation. Certainly social media, if it is anything, is as angry or judgmental or critical as space. It is not necessarily, even though it's a place where many people are connected, there is a lot of conflict in that connection. And anecdotally, I mean, this is true in my life, and I, I'm guessing probably everyone in the room, every one of us knows somebody in our immediate family or our extended family who are at odds or conflict or beefing with somebody else in the family, whether that's kind of low-key conflict or decades-long grudge match, right? We all know anecdotally that there is conflict within our relationships, and so by every metric we're looking at, not only have we become a highly individualized society, but the casualty is on our relationships. Our relationships are suffering. The data is not good. And so one of the reasons we're talking about this is as a church, uh, one of our three values is our faith is about everyday life. Our faith is about everyday life, and therefore we are wading into this issue, this dynamic that, yes, is not new, 700 years in the making, but of course technology and the world we live in now has made it even more of a pressing issue that we need to address what uh, is the state of our relationships and how do we, this is the language we're using for this series, how do we grow healthy relationships? How do we live well with the people we love and are meant to love? And over these few weeks, we're going to unpack that. Like, practically speaking, how do we do this? How do we have healthier relationships? We're going to talk about how do you have good and healthy friendships? How do you have a good and healthy marriage? How do you have a good and healthy relationship between parents and children and siblings? And then in the last two weeks, we're going to give you some um, kind of two keys that will um, enhance and unlock the health and potential in any and every relationship that you have. That's the last couple of weeks in the series. And our hope over these six weeks, really is a couple of things. One is that you would grow, that we would be able to grow in our relationships together as a church, because that's who we are. Like we, this is the beauty of being at the well is like, we don't own any buildings. So we're not under the illusion that the church is a building. No, the church is a community of people. We exist as a community together. And so what a great opportunity to lean into this, to say, yeah, what does it look like in our relationships with each other? And how do we learn and go on the journey together? Not only so that you can have healthier relationships in your life, but friends, listen, so that we, as we grow in health as a community, as we are a community increasingly made up of people with healthy relationships or with people who are working hard and making healthier relationships in their lives, that that would spill out, that it would grow healthy relationships in our culture and in the neighborhoods and the schools and the workplaces and the teams that we're a part of. Um, because the world around us needs healthier relationships too. And this is the great gift, right? This is what God is doing for us isn't just for us. It's for the world around us. So how does health begin to spread? Like a new kind of pandemic, healthy relationships. And so that's the goal over these next few weeks. I want to start today uh, with the, is the fact that both neuroscience and scripture are pointing us in the same direction when it comes to paying attention to our healthy relationships. 
Kurt Thompson, who is a doctor of uh, psychiatry and a researcher and an author, has talked about this connection between our brains and, and, the, and our, our neuroplasticity, in other words, our brain's ability to learn new things, our neuroscience, like what makes up our bodies and how our brains work, and our relationships. And I want you to listen to just a couple of clips as how he describes this and also the connection to our faith. There are perhaps many reasons whereby which we have come to where we are in history. One thing seems to be rather evident, and that is that we love knowing things. We almost have an insatiable thirst for knowing things. It also appears that most of our interest in knowing things is in order to control and reduce our distress and anxiety that largely comes not because we don't know things, but because we are not known. It's interesting that we live in a world that for the last perhaps 300 years has largely been shaped by an ethos that encourages and invites independence, invites people to make their own choices without necessarily needing to be connected to other people. That tends to be a very different plausibility structure than a biblical one, which from the get-go addresses the world and says, let us make mankind in our image. Let them then rule and have dominion over the earth. Let them live like us, essentially. And that's a pretty crucial statement because we hear in that, that the intention for women and men, by God's design, was for us to not simply live together, but that we would be increasingly more deeply known by one another. Interpersonal neurobiology, interestingly enough, is tending to give us different information than what our typical scientific direction tends to go. It tends to say, we don't really know ourselves until we see ourselves in somebody else's eyes. This is replete throughout the biblical narrative even though it's being newly discovered by neuroscientists in the 21st century, this is information that, as the writer to the Ecclesiastes would say, is not really new under the sun. We're just simply putting a different spin on it. So to the degree that we aren't just simply striving to know information, but to the degree that we are willing to be known by others in all of our dreadfulness, in all of our darkness and strangeness, is the degree to which I then become known to myself. And I can't really do that, nor will I experience that, I think, with God until and or unless I'm doing that with other people that are just sitting three feet away from me. It's so fascinating. And in his book, The Anatomy of the Soul, Thompson goes on to say this. While it is true that we each have separate brains, our minds are interconnected in many complex and mysterious ways. I believe our lives will be abundant, joyful, and peaceful only to the degree that we are engaged, known, and understood by one another. I also believe we cannot separate what we do with our brains and our relationships from what we do with God. God has designed our minds, part of his good creation, to invite us into a deeper, more secure, more courageous relationship, both with him and with one another. I think this is incredible, this idea that, in fact, the language Kurt Thompson uses in his book is that the other person is a mirror back to us, that, that the actual mirror that changes our lives is not the one where we see our own reflection, but another person, like he said, three feet away from us, that our brains begin to work in conjunction with each other as we know another person and as we are known by them. That relationships are essential 
to us actually becoming the me I want to be. That if I want to actually think about, oh, where, where do I want to be in life? The person I want to be, the career I want to have, or how I want to grow as a person, which like he said, we all want to learn. We all want to grow. That the key of that is actually not in I and me, but in we and us and in our relationship with God, that this is a highly spiritual conversation, how we deal with and grow and have healthy relationships. You know, Thompson is interesting, quoted from the, the second page of the library of the Bible. But I want to read now from one of the very last pages, right near the end of the scripture, that reinforces and says, as he says, the same thing that is all the way through scripture, that this is actually uh, not something that is 700 years old. This is several, a few thousand years old, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, is God's understanding of how we are wired as people. Listen to how one of the authors uh, writing after Jesus had come and died and been raised to life and was writing to a Jesus community about the essential um, nature of what relationships mean in our lives. This is 1 John 4, verses 7 to 12. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. Now, if you are familiar with this passage, or maybe not, maybe this is the first time you've heard it, or maybe like me, you've read it many times, it's easy to, I think, read it in a certain way. And I've kind of traditionally read it like, uh, hey, listen, like, you know, if you say you love God, you better love people, right? Like this imperative and um, like a command and maybe even a little bit of guilt. Like, come on, God loved you so much. How come you don't love other people? <laughs> and and I, I do think there is some imperative in this, but I, I, let's step back from it and read it in light of what we were just talking about, of how essential relationships are to our own development as people, both with God and each other. Look at actually the flow <laughs> of this argument that this writer makes. In verse eight, he says this. He says, God is love. Like he's not saying God is loving, although God is loving. He's not describing love as one of God's many attributes. He's saying God is in, him very, in his very self, love. He is the fullest, truest picture of love. It is synonymous with his, who he is, his identity which I think says this, that the being at the center of the universe is a being that is known as love, which I think leads us to be able to say this, relationships are at the center of the universe, right? It is the core, the center of who we are and what it means to be human and what it means to live in this world is love in relationships because God who has created us, who is himself at the center, who holds everything together is, the author says, he is literally love incarnate. And his argument is, okay, since we are children of this God, <laughs> that DNA is in us, right? Because if that's in God's very nature and we are children of God, we are God's offspring, then that is in us. Love is at the core of who we are and who we are meant to be. If we are really in God, then that is in us. There's just an inherent connection between the love that is in God and the love that is in us and what that means about the relationships we have. And then his argument is, this is my paraphrase, if our relationships are a mess, right? If we are not being loved and are not showing love, we cannot know God's love. 
there, there's a that means we're disconnected in a sense. If we if we aren't exchanging love, we aren't in loving relationships. If we aren't knowing others and being known, we can't know God either. There's a disconnect there. It's not like oh God won't let you if you don't do. It's not a conditional thing. It's like these two things are so tied together. They are one in the same. To know God is to the God who is love is to have love in you. If you don't have love in you, you can't know this God. He's putting these two things together. And then he gets to the kicker in verse 12. Listen to this. No one has ever seen God, right? God is spirit. But if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. This is incredible. He says, God, how can people know and see a God who has no flesh that they can't actually see? Well, they can know God and know this God who is love when they see us and when we are filled up with the love of God in our relationships with each other. When that happens, God becomes visible to people. God makes himself visible through the love that we have with each other. How, did, how does God make himself known? Well, first and foremost, he did it through Jesus who came in the flesh God made himself flesh so that we could see and know him. But then Jesus does this incredible thing. He forms this community of people and he sends them out as his body, right? His flesh and blood as we are flesh and blood. So now how do people know God? They know him as the one who is himself love when they experience us and our love for each other. Our healthy relationships, our loving relationships make God visible to the world. That's how this works. God shows up in that. And it says, I love this language. It says, it's brought to full expression, or some of your uh, translations will say, God's love is made complete or perfect in us. It doesn't mean perfect as in we never make any mistakes. It means this completeness. There's a fulfillment in our own lives, like which is often what we're after, right? As individuals, like we think, okay, how do I have personal fulfillment, self-actualization in my job, in my love life, in my whatever, with my finances or in the, the career that I end up doing or whatever it is. How do I have that fullness, that completeness? He says, actually, when we share love with one another, we are full. We are made complete as human beings beings. The bottom line, both from scripture and neuroscience is this. We need relationships to grow, to become who we want to be and who we need to be, to achieve that sense of growth and fulfillment as individuals. We need relationships. The me and the I actually begins with we and us. But here's the thing relationships don't grow by themselves, right? We need relationships to grow, but relationships don't grow by themselves. And, and here is, if I can say this, here's the conundrum we find ourselves in at this particular time in history, even though these pages were written, you know, many, 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 many years ago, even though the mirror was invented 700 years ago, um, at this particular time in the 21st century, adding to this uh, story, technology and where we are at, we, here's the conundrum. We need relationships to grow, but they require work. And it's harder than ever to put in the work. We need relationships to grow, but they require work to grow. And it's harder than ever to put in the work. What's easy, like uh, good relationships, healthy relationships don't happen by themselves. But there are some things that do just happen by themselves in relationship. And if I can say this, like our relationships are the soil in which whatever's going on in our life grows, right? And good soil is hard to cultivate. It's harder than ever, actually. And, I, and I'm going to explain why I say that. It is harder than ever to cultivate that. But other types of soil grow effortlessly by themselves. <laughs> You know what goes by itself? Shallow soil. It is very easy to have shallow relationships, right? It's easy to scroll through and see your friends on social media and, and click like and click heart and whatever. Much harder to call them up to how you doing. Much harder to call them up and say, can we go out? 
I just don't want to be alone this evening. It's harder to take a relationship that you kind of hanging out with or a friend or whatever, or someone you work with or go to school with or play on a team with and actually have a deeper conversation to talk about something other than the weather or other than sports or other than what you're doing this weekend. That's hard. What's easy is to just stay on the surface. You know what's easy is for you and your spouse to just watch another episode of that show that you love where you sit next to each other but slowly you're growing apart because your relationship is shallow. It's easy to just keep doing it. It's way harder to stop and say, let's go for a walk. Let's talk. I feel like we haven't connected in a while or there's a conversation we need to have or there's something I haven't told you that we need to talk about. That's way harder. It's way easier for that relationship to just stay on the surface. Shallow soil happens by itself. You know what other types of soil happens by itself? Weedy soil or overcrowded soil, right? What I mean by that is it is easy to have our lives full of all kinds of stuff that isn't that important or that isn't actually growing depth and health in our relationship. So we can be busy. It's easy to, you know, try to take another course to add some letters to the end of your name or try to take on some extra uh, uh, jobs at work to get promoted. It's easy to kind of try out for another team and go make that and play sports. It's easy to go to the gym by yourself. It's easy to uh, add things to your life that in the end, they're not bad, but they are sucking away right? Like weeds in a garden, the nutrients and life from the stuff that really needs time and attention to grow. It's easy to add commitments. Think about how during COVID, everything got wiped out. Everything got taken out of your life. How easy did we add back in almost 10 times as much or whatever? And it just feels like, man, we're busier than ever. It's easy to have an overcrowded life It's hard to cut out some of the stuff that's sucking away time from the relationships that need time to grow. Weedy soil is easy to have. It happens by itself. And you know what else happens by itself? Hard soil. Hard soil. Because here's the thing. In any relationship, hurt, disappointment, misunderstanding, anger, offense, selfishness, is inevitable. So there's going to be wounds. There's going to be hurts. There's going to be kind of little slights. There's going to be large offenses, small offenses. There's going to be opportunities for the soil to get hard, right? Those not confronting those things, not dealing with those things, not putting in the work to try to fix, to try to repair, to try to say sorry, to try to forgive, to try to have grace, to try to follow up, to try to work at something that has not just been neglected but hurtful. It's easy to let the soil get hard over time through bitterness or passiveness, right? Sometimes passiveness and apathy is a sign. Like it's actually making the soil harder. It's not active anger or criticism. It's neglect. And we can do that when we felt hurt or when we feel hopeless about a certain relationship. Hard soil happens by itself just by leaving it. It's easier to unattend to it. It's easier not to follow up. Shallow soil, weedy soil, hard soil, those things happen by themselves. So I want to give you a moment, Stephen, now as we're in this uh, space together, to just reflect as you think about um, maybe a friendship in your life or your marriage, if you're married, or in your family, if you have kids, whether they're at home or not, or perhaps even your relationship with God, or maybe some other relationship in your life. As you as, like, think about just one of those things that comes to mind that you'd say, yeah, it's not, I don't think it's quite uh, what it could be. <laughs> Which soil most describes that relationship? Is it just shallow that um, you don't know how to take that deeper or you haven't invested in making that deeper? You've never really gone past the surface of their life, of your life, of really being known by each other? Is it, just overcrowded. Like there are too many things, good, like not bad things, but not important enough things that are actually sucking away nutrients, time, energy from the really important relationships or from that particular one. Overcrowded. Or perhaps is it hard? Has there been some hurt? Has there been some disappointment? Has there been some frustration? Has there been some unforgiveness? And you just let it lie. And now there's some bitterness and 
grudge or just apathy or distance that has grown. Just take a moment to think about relationship in your life and what, where, or what combination maybe or maybe one of those soils it best describes where that relationship is at. I think it's fair to say, right? Good soil is hard to cultivate. Those other soils just kind of happen by themselves, but good soil, that isn't accidental or unintentional. It takes work. And so here's what that means. We need relationships in order to grow, but that means we need to grow our relationships, right? We need relationships in order to grow, in order to become the person I want to be, to have the life I want to have. We need our relationships to actually grow us. But to do that, I need to grow my relationships. I need to actually do the work to invest in those key relationships in my life. And you do as well. And here, the fact is, with technology, it is now more inconvenient than ever to do the work, right? It is inconvenient. It's very convenient to just order food to our home. It's, it's very convenient to do things ourselves. It's very convenient to stay inside after a long work day. It's very easy to stay to ourselves when we're now spending more and more time working on our own to begin with. It's much harder to book time for a conversation about something that didn't quite go well the last interaction you had, or maybe just a little bit of a slight that you felt, or maybe some kind of hurt, or maybe you thought you may have hurt another person and it's not quite clear. It's much harder, right? It's very inconvenient to book time for that. We don't want to do it emotionally. We don't feel like we have time for that in our calendar. It's inconvenient to do that. It's inconvenient to try to take a conversation, let's say, with a person that you've been going to church with for years. Maybe you've been in home group for years, but never gone past the surface. You've never asked many questions about some things, and they haven't asked. Or perhaps the parent that you sit next to, it's your kid's games all the time. You're always there. It's way easier to just go on your phone or go for a run or go do something else. It's much harder to take a conversation deeper. It's more inconvenient to see if a friend wants to join you on an errand you have to do that day. Or you got to go get some plants from the nursery, or you got to go grocery shopping, or you got to do some work on your car or whatever. It's more inconvenient to call someone to see if they're available to come with you to just be there. It's easier to do it yourself. It's very inconvenient to cut something out of your life, to just say, no, we're not going to do that this year. We're not going to do that this summer. And maybe you're going to risk disappointing your kid because you're not going to play that sport. Or you're going to risk disappointing a family member because you're not going to go to this thing. Or you're going to risk disappointing somebody else in your life or whatever. You're going to change something or cut it out. And you think, well, what am I going to do to actually create space to invest and grow healthy relationships? It is very inconvenient to do that. But here's the amazing gift. <laughs> we are part of a church. We are a community. We are a we. <laughs> yes, each of us is unique individuals loved by God individually, and each of us matters individually. But as a church, we define ourselves first as a we, not an I, as an us, not a me, which means we have this amazing opportunity to do this together to actually learn how to have healthy relationships with each other and to have healthier relationships in every aspect of our life. We actually get to see, you know when it says here, um, here in, um, in that final verse, verse 12, like when God's love lives in us and we exchange and we love one another, his love comes to full expression. In other words, it can be seen. We need to see that in each other, right? Like we need to see people who are full of the love of God and have healthy relationships in their life to be able to learn from them. Say, oh, I'd love to spend time with you. We need to see that in, in our groups or as we hang out together. We need to see um, younger marriages. You need to see older married couples or married couples a few years ahead of you to see, okay, not perfect marriages, but ones that seem to be thriving, seem to be loving, seem to be safe and stable so we can learn from them. 
Younger parents, you need to see older parents, people who have had time and years to do this. Young adults, you need to look at people who are further along in their careers and seem to have stable, healthy relationships in their lives. Young people like kids and our youth, you need to look at young adults and people who are a little bit older to see it so that you can say, oh, can you help me? I need to grow that way. I know I have been benefited at every stage of my life in the church. I've been in the church literally my entire life, was born into it in a sense. And at every stage, other people have helped shape me. It helped me grow, helped me see God and see myself and see what it really means to love each other. This is the gift we have as a church. And so my challenge really for you out of this is over the next five weeks, like let's agree as a church community to learn to do the work together. It's hard. It's hard to do the work. It's easier to let shallow soil and weedy soil and hard soil just develop by itself. It's harder to create and cultivate good soil. But let's agree to do this together. To say, okay, we want to learn. This is what we, we have the gift of a community. Let's lean into this together. Would you accept that challenge? I want to give you a moment just to pray uh, a quiet prayer under your breath to God, who is, according to Jesus, the gardener. That's one of the names Jesus says, my father is the gardener. In fact, the opening pages of scripture, when we do hear the creation account, it's a picture of God on his hands and knees, digging in the dirt as a gardener, cultivating new good soil. Jesus says, he's the one that makes things grow in our lives. So I want to give you a moment, just 30 seconds to pray a prayer that invites God, the gardener to come and turn maybe the, the, the shallow or the weedy or the hard soil in your life to turn it up, to garden, to make something beautiful and healthy grow in your life. So just take a moment to do that. Just a quiet prayer. as you have invited God, the gardener, to come and work the soil in your life, in your relationships, <laughs> I challenge you to come show up as well, to do the work with him, to come every week during this series, to join God as he's turning up that dirt and making a good soil in your life. If you're in a home group, to be part of that group, to lean in, not just be physically present, but to lean in to say, yeah, I want this to get deeper. I want this to get richer. I want to grow these relationships. You're part of youth group. This is group season um, or a young adults group to lean in and say, yeah, I want to grow. I want to learn how to do this. And I don't have to do this alone. I have my church family and I've got the gardener that I've invited to make good soil in my life so that healthy things can begin to grow.